I'm going over a webinar on an IP guide to integrated control with the M1. Today we're going to be going over some simple networking terms, some how-tos, introducing a new product, integration of the M1, and some troubleshooting techniques you can take away with you. So if there's no questions to begin with, we're going to get started. All right, first thing we'd like to talk about is benefits of networking the M1. First of all, you can remotely control the system from anywhere using a PC or a smartphone. We offer central station alarm monitoring, email notifications, installers can connect to their system remotely for programming changes and to do some simple diagnostics. We'd like to take this time to discuss some software and apps available. The first is the new M1 to go. It's a user interface software for Windows computers. We'd also like to talk about the e keypad app for the iPhone and iPad and the my key my key e keypad. I'm sorry, my keypad pro for the droids. The last two are third party apps created by third party engineers and uh, the new M1 to go is a product from Elk Products. It allows remote access from a PC from anywhere in the world. You're able to connect straight to the M1, not to a server, so you have real-time performance. It's portable. It can be installed on a USB thumb drive. And one of the best features is it's free. Once this webinar is finished, if you'd like to log into our website, you can download a free copy of it today and take it. and. Uh, install it and use it immediately. Now briefly, the M1 to go software allows the end user to access their system locally or remotely. It allows them to integrate with the security side as well as the automation side of the security system. As you can see, we have the security button and once in the security pages, they can check the arm and disarm status. They can arm and disarm the system they can activate any of the function keys. They can switch to a different keypad or into a different area from the app. Check the status of the zones as well as view the log. And once you retrieve the log, you can then save it to a file. Under the automation side of the software, you have control over your lighting, your thermostats, as well as your outputs. This is a new product, and once again, one of the best features is it's free. We do have a question I'd like to go ahead and address about that new software. Um, the, the question is about video. Um, the m one to go software, um, again, it is a free application, and it's um, intended to be an interface to the M1 system. So we're, at this time, really do not have any plans to add any you know, video capability to that application as it is intended to be an M1 interface. Um, so the RM software that we previously offered that had some video capability, that's still available. So if you're interested in an application that has some video capability, you can take a look at that. Um, but we don't have any plans to add that to M1-to-Go at this time. All right, thank you. All right, today we're going to discuss some uh, basic networking. And what we're looking at right here on the screen is... Uh, a very simple diagram showing what would typically be in a home environment or maybe a small office environment. We have two desktop computers which are hardwired to the router. We also have a Wi-Fi enabled tablet or a laptop uh, communicating wirelessly to the local area network. The local area network is then connected to a cable or a DSL modem in which case would then communicate to the internet. Now we have two networking terminologies. We have LAN, which is local area network, and we have WAN, which is wide area network. 
In our block diagram previously, the home office or the uh, small the home office or the, the small office environment would be considered a local area network. The WAN would be, con uh, you could call the internet a WAN because it is a wide area network. Now devices which are connected to the local area network, each one of those would receive a unique IP address from the router. In this scenario, the router is serving up IP addresses in the range of 192.168.1. something, and each individual device connected to the local area network would receive a unique IP address. The DSL modem also receives an IP address but it too receives a public IP address which is on the wide area network or the internet. Now when you're at your computer and you want to access a website, you would open your web browser and you would type into the website, let's say for instance google.com. Your computer then communicates through the gateway to the internet and the DNS server, which stands for domain name server, would take your request and cross-reference it to a lookup table in order to provide the actual IP address of Google. In this scenario, we're uh, illustrating which Google might actually be 173.194.75.147. That's a lot of information to try to remember, and this address may change periodically. So that's why DNS, uh, DNS servers are there to keep up with the changing IP addresses so that you can type in your URL or Google.com and load the web page. We'll learn a little more later about DNS servers in the M1 application. Now, the two types of IP addresses. There's dynamic IP addresses and static IP addresses. A dynamic IP address is automatically assigned and can change periodically each time a device, or your computer, or laptop, or your, your tablet connects to a network. When you connect your computer to your home network, it may get one address. The office may give it a different address. And if you hit a Wi-Fi hotspot, it'll get a different address as well. So it needs to be a dynamic IP so it can receive an IP address from the gateway. A static IP address is manually assigned address and does not change unless the device is reconfigured with a new address. Some devices on a local area network need to be assigned a static so that they can be accessed remotely. For example, perhaps maybe a camera, or in our case, the M1 XEP. This is also important to keep the static IP address to allow for the port forwarding function when trying to access the system remotely. Other terminology that you will hear when, when dealing with networks is subnet mask and gateway. You can think of the subnet mask like a filter used to selectively allow or deny access to a network. It can be used to subdivide a network. It identifies which part of an IP address is reserved for the network and which part is available for the host use. The gateway, which in our case was our, our DSL cable modem, uh, a residential gateway is used to connect a host network, like our local area network, to the internet, and like I said, typically via a DSL or cable modem. It also serves as an access point to other networks. Now for those that are familiar with networking and networking terminology, this is, this is uh, basic information. For those that are not as familiar with networking, 
and terminology and how to set up local area networks. There's great information available on the internet. There's also resources at your local bookstores and libraries. You may also find one day classes or seminars through your local community college which will help better understand networking and the networking terminology. A great tool to use when configuring your local area network is called IP config. It is uh, you open a command prompt through Windows and you type in IP config forward slash all. And what information is provided back will include the computer's IP address on the local area network, the subnet mask, the default gateway, and the DNS server information. Now, for if you're having issues connecting or anything, this would be a, a good tool to use to see that the what the router's address is and what your computer's address is, just to make sure they're on the same same network. Now we talked about being able to access a device remotely, and that's done through port forwarding. Port forwarding allows for an outside access to a device on the local area network, for instance, the M1 XEP or a camera or some other device. Uh, specified ports are forwarded to a local IP address assigned to the device. Port forwarding is configured through the router setup table. Every router is a little bit different, so the setup tables, the setup screens may look a little different from one manufacturer to another. A great place to get help in these matters is either through the tech support of the router or through portforward.com. Yes. Brad, I think we may be having an audio issue. Okay, I'm sorry, are we having an audio issue? I can hear you fine now. I think you were cutting out there for just a second. Okay, okay. Everything fine now? It seems to be, yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, right now we're going to talk about DDNS, and that stands for Dynamic Domain Name Server, and when to use it. Most standard accounts from your Internet service provider are assigned a dynamic public IP address, which means it could change whenever the router reboots or periodically the ISP may reassign a new IP address, public IP address to your router. A DDNS service keeps track of the changing public IP address and provide a fixed URL that is redirected to the public IP address. That's a lot of information, but basically what is happening is, let's say for instance, you set up an account with a DDNS provider, you create a host name, and in this case our host name is smithsmarthome.dyndns.org. You're at a remote site and you want to try to connect to smithsmarthome.dyndns.org. So from the remote computer, you would type in this information, the information gets uh, sent through the internet to the DDNS server to look up the current IP address. Once the IP address is returned from the DDNS server, it then connects to your router. and the port forwarding would direct it to a specific device on the local area network. Now that's a brief description of local area network versus wide area network versus how to set up a DNS 
server so that you have access to your router remotely. Now, let's add the M1 into the local area network. And we do that by using the ELK M1XEP or the Ethernet interface. Now the M1XEP will connect to the router and then it connects to the main serial port on the M1. By default the XEP is shipped under DHCP meaning it will accept an address from the router. Once you are able to connect to the XEP, you can then change it to a static IP on your local area network. The XEP module provides both secure and non-secure ports. The secure port by default is 2601 for remote applications such as your ELK RP software, m one to go and the smartphone apps. The non-secure port is for local applications like the ELK RMS software or uh, Crestron touchscreens, AMX touchscreens and so forth. Right, do we have any questions about what we've gone over so far? It's kind of quick but it's uh, kind of a brief overview of, of what we've covered in previous webinars. Uh, any questions so far? Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, okay. There were uh, quite a few different questions that came in about the m one to go software, so um, just okay. to uh, generalize and, and cover most of those questions. Um, that application is a Windows-based application. It does require the .NET framework 4.0 or later in order to run, so you have to run that in a Windows environment. Um, at this particular time, we are not developing a Mac specific version of that software. Um, if you have a Windows emulation environment, um, something like Parallels on a Mac, then you could install this software, but it, again it does have to be in the Windows environment. Um, had another question, um, this goes back to the discussion about the, the DDNS and, and what that is and when you need to use it. Um, the, one question that came in was about routers allowing multiple DDNS addresses. Um, that's, you know, the, the router can be programmed to provide the updates to the DDNS service or, or the M1XCP can do that, but um, th just like the ISP, it, when you set up your internet service with them, they're giving you an IP address for your network. That's a single IP address. Um, so it, the same kind of applies with the DDNS, it's keeping up with that IP address that your service provider's giving you and, and you know, giving you a URL for that. So you really generally wouldn't have multiple ones. Um, th this question that was asked was related to multiple devices on the network, like if you had an XCP and a DVR and a music server, that sort of thing. Um, the port forwarding is what tells the you know, the, the router what device you want to talk to. So, um, you know, you, if you're trying to connect into the M1, for instance, uh, from your smartphone app, then you're going to be coming in on port 2601. And that's why you have to set up the port forwarding for port 2601 to be forwarded to the M1 XCP on the local network. And we'll get into that a little bit more as far as how you do that here in just a minute. But um, So your DVR, for instance, would be on a different port and you would have that port forwarded to the DVR. Um, so on and so forth. So the, the DNS is, is kind of, it, it's just an alias, so to speak, for the IP address that your service provider is assigning you. So that's one IP address for your network. Um, and the, the DDNS service, um, because it is keeping track of the dynamic address and the giving you that static URL, um, it is, um, you, you can use that instead of having to purchase a static IP address from your internet service provider. Now there may be some cases where purchasing a static IP address from the service provider is desirable um, and you know, in, in that case you would certainly want to go ahead and do that and you wouldn't necessarily need a DDNS service unless you would just you know, like to be able to have a, a, a name there for it instead of an IP address, but um, you know, that the, the, the point is really to keep up with the di dynamic address, so um, that, that can uh, be an alternative to purchasing a static IP address from your service provider. Um, don't 
see here. I think at this particular point, well, we just want to go ahead. I think some of the other questions that are coming in may be getting a little, may be getting a little ahead of ourselves, and we're going to cover some of this material, and so then we can kind of go back and review those um, after we go through some more material here. Okay, great. Good questions. Appreciate that. All right, now that we covered some of the basics on on the local area network and the wide area network, let's uh, let's talk a little about the RP programming to set up our Ethernet module, our M1XEP. All right, the first thing when you open an account or you create an account, the first screen you're looking at is the account detail screen. And in the lower right-hand corner of the account detail screen is the M1XEP setup. So you would click on the M1XEP setup, and that will open the following screen. From here, you can click Find, and that will RP will query the local area network to see how many M1XEPs it finds and return its IP address. So here we found one XEP module with its MAC address and the IP address and port number. You would click Use Selected, and you could close the XEP setup screen. From the account details screen, you should now see the system URL IP on the local area network and the port 2601. To connect, you would click the connection icon and network. Once you're connected and you've resolved your conflicts, you can once again go back into the XEP setup and under the TCP IP settings tab, you can now assign a name to your XEP, and this is on for the local area network, you can now change it from a DHCP, which is factory, to a static IP. Now this is important to do because of the port forwarding. If it's left in DHCP and the router should happen to power cycle or you power cycle the XEP, it would have a new IP address in some cases. If you port forwarded to one IP address and now that IP address has changed, your, your app or your software is not going to be able to connect. So once we have our IP address, we can click Use Static, double check to make sure your subnet mask and your default gateways are correct. Below here is the DNS server information. We want to make sure that that information is correct for when the system tries to send emails and so forth. If you don't know what this information is, you can obtain DNS automatically. We want to make sure we enable the non-secure port 2601 in our secure port is, I'm sorry, 2101 and our secure port is 2601. For the most part, this is all the setup you need on the TCP IP settings tab. Password tab is used by M1TO-GO and the smartphone apps to give you an extra layer of security when accessing the system. You can set up up to eight individual username and passwords. The email function of the XEP module on this screen, you would enter your email service provider, their outgoing port, a valid from address, the username and password to log into the account. Now, at this time, the M1XEP does not support the SSL encryption on the body of the email message. Uh, certain services like Gmail and Hotmail uh, require that SSL encryption on the body. We do encrypt the username and password in the, in the, uh, the address, but not the body of the message. 
you can set up 16 individual email messages, and these are predefined email messages that you can use in rules and send those out during certain events. You can also configure an email address to be a text message to a phone following the provider's uh, setup information to, to send that message to a phone, like the 10-digit number followed by vtext.com if you're going to Verizon, for instance. On this screen, we have some rule examples, email rule examples, uh, based upon system events such as arming or disarming and a low temperature. In rule number one, we see whenever area one arm state becomes disarmed, then send email message number two to the following address. And we've configured email number two to send the Smith home has been disarmed. Rule number two, whenever every one hour and the temperature of zone 16, which would be our uh, zone temperature sensor, actual temperature is less than 35 degrees, send email message number four. Email message number four is, has been set up to send a low temperature alert. Now, what you configure in the message body is exactly what's going to be sent. At this time, there's no way to insert additional data like the actual temperature, zone number, user, alarm condition. Uh, you have a 255 character body of the message, and that's uh, what's in the body of the message is what will be sent. XEP also has the capability of sending alarm reports via the internet to a central monitoring service that has either the SureGuard 3 receiver or the Osborne Hoffman receiver. Now to configure the system to communicate over the internet, the first thing we would do would be set up a telephone number in ELKRP. The reporting format will be number six for Ethernet, M1 XEP the dial attempts uh, greater than zero, and then check the events that we won't transmit it, as well as the area. Back under the XEP setup screen for the central station, you'll enter the type of receiver we'll be communicating with, either DSC SureGuard or the Osborne Hoffman the account number that the central station has provided you, and the IP address or URL for their receiver and the port number. All right, under the next tab, Dynamic DNS Server tab, in the event you don't have a static public IP address for your router, you can go through one of the services that provide you with a host name or a URL, and they keep up with the changing IP address, public IP address of your router. Some example of these sites is dyndns.com, no-ip.com, and changeip.com. When you're configuring the system, Make sure that uh, when you enter the URL IP for your host name provider that you follow the format as far as members and so forth in the URL IP field. You would enter the username and password associated with signing up with, with their service and the host name that you've created through their service. The following box would allow you to receive emails in the event something happened and the DYN DNS server didn't update due to a change in public IP address. And if you'd like to be notified each time your public IP address changes, you can check the box below that. And in some cases, your public IP address may not change that often. In other situations, it may change quite frequently.
This way, when you set up your host name, you can use that one host name, in this case, the Smith Smart Home DYNDNS.org, in your smartphone apps, M1 to go, to be able to access the system remotely. Do we have any questions? Yes, definitely. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so, and I think that we may be going to hit on this a little bit more, but there were quite a few questions related to this. Um, so when you were back on the email page, and we were talking about the, the email limitations as far as the, you know, the SSL connection, um, you had mentioned Gmail as one of the services that requires that, and so mm -hmm. that does mean that the M1 XCP cannot send email through a Gmail server. That doesn't mean that it can't send email to a Gmail address. Correct. Um, so again, what you're looking at here is the mail server the mail is going through. It wouldn't be able to go through a Gmail server. Um, we do have some alternatives uh, if, if you that's the you know email account that your customer has and um, so you're not going to be able to get that working. Um, we have some suggested alternatives where you know you can set up an account with like GMX here that we're showing on the screen as one of those alternatives. So there are other things that you can do, um, you know, other mail servers that you can use to get those mails uh, sent through. Um, you know, I also related to the same question, got a number of, of folks asking, um, you know, is this something that we plan to make changes to or support at some point? Um, to r really the answer to that at this point is not something I, I really know. Um, it's not something that we're currently working on. Um, however, we are looking in the future about how we're going to be handling things and um, you know, everything uh, going more towards like the cloud type services and stuff like that. So we're we're at this point just really looking at what options that we have and, and trying to decide which path we're going to go on, but I, I couldn't tell you right now that that particular issue within the M1 XCP will be changed. I don't, I don't have that answer. Um, try to maybe get a little bit more detail for you on where we're headed with that and provide that in the follow-up if I can get uh, you know, some information from one of our engineers. But right now, you know, it's that this is the limitation that we have to work with, and so you know, we would want to discuss alternatives and, and not get too hung up on where we're going to go in the future with that because we're just not real clear on that at the moment. Um, at least I'm not, that's what I'm saying, so I'll have to get some more information on that for you. Um, had an, a couple other interesting questions here. Um, so if you set up a, a dynamic DNS account and you know, so you've got this this URL like the, the you know, smith-smarthome at um, you know, the .dns.org address that we've been looking at. Um, you would use that address for remote access. Um, you would not use that address on your local network. And the reason why you wouldn't do that is because most routers um, will not allow a request to go out of the network and come back into it. So a device that's on the local network would not use the outside address or outside method of accessing a device that's on the same network it's on. You want to have that local communication happening behind the router, not going out and coming back into it. The router doesn't allow that to happen, at least most of them don't. So that's why you wouldn't use your URL that you set up with your DDNS account for local access. You would still want to use your local IP address, which again should be a static IP address that you've assigned so it's going to be fixed. Um, and the M1 to go software allows you to set up profiles, so you can have um, different profiles set up for, you know, if you happen to have a, a client that maybe has an M1 in their home and they also have one in their vacation home or one in their home, one in their business, you know, that sort of thing, um, they would be able to set up different, uh, different profiles to connect to those different systems. Um, you could also use the, the profiles, uh, you know, if you have a device that can be connected to your um, local network, maybe it's you know, a Wi-Fi based device that can connect to your local network, but then it also has, um, you know, internet capability so that you could use that same device to connect to your system remotely over the internet, you could set that up as two different profiles so that you could have a local profile and a remote profile so that you're not having to try to remember or pop this stuff in each time. So uh, there, there's ways to, to manage that where you don't have to uh, 
you know, deal with remembering that or switching things out. You can just set the profiles up in the M1-to-Go. And uh, M1-to-Go is, is a software application. We had a, a question earlier about when you would use it or when you would use port forwarding. Th those are not interchangeable things. You, if you want to use M1-to-Go outside the local network, you have to do port forwarding. Port forwarding is something that you do through the router to allow um, access from outside the network to a device that's on the network. So that's something that even M1-to-Go used remotely would require port forwarding. M1-to-Go is a piece of software. Um, it's a user interface. So um, you have you know, a screen for security and for lighting and that sort of thing. So you're controlling the system from it. It is not a replacement for port forwarding or any other network function. Um, we had a question about um, putting a user in the arm disarm email. Um, you have 16, you can't really see from the screen here, but you have 16 different email messages that you can send. Um, you, you know, put in an email address and the message that you want sent to it. If you want different messages sent to the same address, then you do what you see similar to the screen here where you're duplicating the email address and just putting in different messages. So on a, on a small scale, um, if, you, if there were you know, a couple of users and you wanted to know which user disarmed the system, you could set up different messages here. You know, instead of having um, Smith Home has been armed, um, you could have Smith Home has been armed by Joe. And then another one that says Smith Home has been armed by Sally. Um, that sort of thing. So you could do that on a very small scale. But again, you have 16 emails, so you can't really cover a great number of users that way. And you cannot insert variables into the email. It's the, the purpose of the email feature of the M1 XCP is to provide general notifications. Um, it's not intended as, as a way to provide detailed information or as any kind of replacement for monitoring. All right, good questions. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, we, we've, we've got more here that have come in. I'm reading them okay. reading over them. All right, we'll um, take a minute. Okay. Um, we had a question here. What if there's no ha house landline, cell phones only? How do you set up, monitor, and emails? The features that we've been talking about today are not at all dependent on a phone line. Um, I'm, I feel like maybe there's something else there that's a little unclear for that person. So if you if you want to elaborate on your question, please do so. But um, the M1 XEP connects to a router, connects to the M1. There's no phone line of any kind involved in the features that we've been discussing today. And if you want to go ahead and, and proceed on with, uh, you know, I think we've got a couple more slides, and I'll try to... Um, read over some more of these questions. and uh, Great questions coming in. Keep them coming. We really uh, like a good, engaged audience, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Right now, we're going to get to a little bit of troubleshooting. Uh, if, by chance, for some reason, you have issues with the Elk RP software connecting, Always a good idea to check to make sure that the cable is plugged into the M1 serial port 0. It's in the upper right hand corner. It's a straight through 9 pin serial cable. The distance should not exceed more than 50 feet from the M1 to the XEP. And then the XEP plugs into a router, a regular network cabling there. The XEP uh, must be connected to serial port 0. Uh, the M1 should be powered up first, then the XEP module. And then the XEP and the computer must be on the same subnet for local connections. So if you find the XEP, let's say for instance at 192.168.0.10, but under IP config forward slash all, you notice your IP address for your computer is 192.168.1. 50, for example. That's two different subnets, in which case there's, uh, there's a, some troubleshooting guides in the XEP installation manual to show you how to reboot the XEP, so to speak, so you should get an IP address from the router. If a remote software or app connection issue, uh, make sure RP is not connected. It takes priority over any other connection, so if RP connects all other connections, M1 to go, 
your smartphone apps, they are all suspended until RP disconnects. And then of course check your IP address and your port forwarding, uh, your port settings and your port forwarding settings to make sure those are correct. And the smartphone apps and anything connecting remotely should go through the secure connection, not a non-secure port. It's never a good idea to port forward a non-secure port like 2101 is a non-secure port. We would highly recommend for security reasons not to port forward that port to the outside world or to the internet. Uh, if you're having email issues, we need to double check your DNS server information, make sure that's entered correctly on the TCP IP settings tab. And for your RP must be disconnected for the rules to fire. You may have noticed on the email tab, there's a test button. If you want to test the connection and the email capability, while RP is connected, you could click test and it'll send email number one and you should get uh, that message in your inbox within a couple minutes or so. That is the only time a email will send while RP is connected. So if you have a rule that says whenever the Smith home is disarmed then send email number two, make sure RP is disconnected or that that email will not get through. And we've discussed the uh, SSL encryption you can go to our website and under the M1 XEP there's alternatives, uh, GMX, uh, LavaBit, AOL. Those are alternative email providers. The following may be new to some people. This is a diagnostic utility. It's the M1 XEP diagnostic utility. This is a, a free software tool designed for troubleshooting the M1 XEP inter, uh, Ethernet interface. It provides a comprehensive display of the local network settings and some critical setup information in the XEP as well as the local area network. It may also give you some uh, suggestions on how to resolve some, some conflicts. In the event you're having an issue, by all means, download this, run the diagnostic, you can copy the information to clipboard and email that to us and that's good information to help us try to help you resolve the, the, the issue that you may be currently having. The XEP setup diagnostic uh, utility is available from the website under the downloads page. All right. At this time, we're uh, we're almost through with with our presentation. If we can answer some more questions or we'll go over anything which may not have been quite as clear. But, um. Okay. A um, couple of questions here. Um, these are some some basic questions that we get a lot too. So uh, you know, sorry that we didn't already cover these. But um, the M1 XCP is powered from a 12 volt DC power supply that's provided with it. But we did have a person ask, um, can the M1 XCP, XCP be powered from the M1 using one of the auxiliary power connections? Um, the answer is, technically speaking, yes, you can do that. Um, it's the same voltage and, and the system can provide enough current. It's around 300 milliamps to power the M1 XCP. Um, but you have to keep in mind that, that the M1 power supply um, can provide around an amp of continuous current. So 300 milliamps is just under a third of, of your total power. And you have to um, calculate, you know, if you have an XCP there, you have to add that to your keypads and input expanders and anything else that you might have on the data bus, as well as anything else that's being powered from auxiliary power and also um, the other outputs on the system. Um, so on a smaller system, it may be practical to power it from the M1 XCP, uh, or the, may be practical to power the M1 XCP from the M1, um, but in most cases you're not going to want to do that because it's going to consume too much of your control power that you need for other devices. Another thing to keep in mind is that the M1 XCP, if it were powered through the M1, would be using the M1's battery backup for power. Um, so it, it would uh, have battery backup in the case of a power outage, but if your router 
goes down, then the M1 XCP is no longer going to function for you, so having it on the M1's battery doesn't help. So what you may want to consider doing instead of powering the M1 XCP from the control is to actually um, get a, a, a battery backup power supply or UPS and connect your all of your network, crucial network equipment to that. So that would be like your router, any switches that you have, the M1 XCP, you know, that sort of thing. So that, that network equipment has battery backup in case of a power outage. So that, those are just some things to keep in mind. Um, going back to the question about the, the phone line um, and, and the central station, I, I don't know how if you could quickly get back to that, Brad, but one, the first thing that we showed for central station setup was in the telephone section, so now I understand the, the, the question. Um, you're not really programming um, anything for a telephone or a telephone line here per se, but th the way that the software works, it requires an entry on this screen with this particular format, 6, for Ethernet M1 XCP in order to be able to program the central station information on the next slide, you know, in the M1 XCP setup. So you come into the telephones or, you know, you create a telephone, set it up as this format, check the, the boxes for the options that you want, and then you're going to press the uh, M1 XCP setup button that you see just on the right side of the screen. And that will bring you right into the M1 XCP setup, and that's where you'll see the central station tab, and that's where you actually put in like the IP and the port information that you get from your central station. Um, so while we do have this, um, you know, what I can understand could be a confusing stipulation about central station reporting through internet requiring telephone setup, that does not mean it requires a telephone line, it's just the way that it works in the software. Um, let's see, another question that we have here is related to the central station monitoring, and maybe that's something that we might need to go over a little bit more in depth. Do you have RP up, or can you pull that up and maybe get to those screens and uh, in the RP software? Because it seems like we have a lot of questions about that, and I understand that is definitely a uh, feature that is growing in popularity with the uh, phone lines, you know, being less predominantly used and most some customers don't even have them anymore. Maybe they have a digital phone line. So this is a great alternative for phone line reporting. And we may need to uh, delve into that just a little bit deeper. Um, okay, let me, let me okay. Uh, see. While Brad's pulling that up, I um, had a question about um, third-party type integration through serial communications. Um, we have a document on our website that outlines our RS-232 protocol. So that shows you, you know, the data that's coming out of the panel and also the strength that you can send to it to request data or make things happen. Um, when you have the system networked with the M1 XCP, through the unencrypted port, the non-secure port, all of that data um, that you would get see come out of the serial port is passed through that unencrypted port as, as just the raw data, so it is unchanged. Um, so you can reference that document if that's something that you're working with, uh, you're doing some third-party integration through RS-232 communications. That document applies to a connection directly to the main serial port or to a connection through the M1 XCP on the local unencrypted port, which by default is 2101. So you can take a look at that as on our website, on our documents and uh, manuals and documents page. Okay, can I, do we see uh, an RP screen now? Yes. Okay, all right, uh, what was the question again? Um, we just had a number of, of requests and just questions related to the central station part of things, so I thought it may be helpful okay. if you were to go through that setup in real time uh, okay. you know, in, in the software. Sure, sure. Uh, the first thing you'd want to do would be right-click on telephones. We're going to create a new telephone number. In this case, number of telephone numbers to create will be one, starting at number one. So I'll click OK. And now we have telephone number one. Uh, it will be an always report to this number, and 
when I select Ethernet, you see our screen changes. Dial attempts is set to 1, which it just means it's enabled. And as far as report the following using this number, uh, you can select the items. Most definitely the first and the last item should always be checked. The middle three are optional. We check area 1. And then I'd go under my XEP setup under the central station tab. And now we have the option to select which receiver. Uh, SureGuard 3. And let's say the central station gave me account number 1234. And then I would enter their URL that they provide me and the port number in which the signals will be received. Now these other settings that you see on the screen here, like the use encryption or supervise the connection, those things, what we're doing here on this screen is matching the setup that the central station has in their receiver. Um, we, we want to make sure that the M1 is communicating with the receiver in the way that it expects you know, the signals to come in and it expects the device to talk to it. So um, you will only select those options if your central station indicates that they require them. Um, so that's, you know, everything that you see on this screen is information that you should be able to get from your central station when you go to set this up. And they do have to have one of those two particular receivers, either the DSC SureGuard or the OH2000E. Those are the two that we can communicate with through this method. Um, the DSC SureGuard is very popular. A lot of central stations have that, so that um, the, the Osborne Hoffman is a little less popular, but you will also encounter it. But, um, that, that's that's the, the basics of that, so hopefully that helps clear that up a little bit for you. Um, another really good question that we have here related to Central Station, um, if you have the Central Station monitoring set up this way, can you use a telephone as a backup? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, that you, you can set up the Central Station um, information here as the primary, and then as Brad's going to show, you could set up a, another telephone entry that was related to, you know, using the phone line and set that up as your backup. So you would just key in all of your information and then set that as a, uh, a, a top one once you put the information in. And you do want to program the information first. It, uh, when you set a telephone as a backup to the previous telephone, it sort of locks those two together so that you can't make any programming changes without undoing the association between them temporarily. Um, so that's why you want to enter your information first, then set the type to 1, and you'll see that kind of grays the screen out there. But that would allow the telephone to be a backup to the XCP reporting. And we will be providing a copy of the presentation that we used as well as a link to the recording of this webinar. So if there's something that you want to go back over or you want to share um, this information with your coworkers or colleagues, we'll make that available to you. And you should get that early next week. Um, had another question about integration with, um, and the question was specifically about uh, universal devices, ISY. Um, the, and the m one to go application. Um, the m one to go application is going to be able to control whatever lights you have interfaced through the M1 system. So if you can control the light from a system keypad, then you'll be able to control it from m one to go um, So that, that's, again, going through the M1. And just trying to go back over here. I know I wasn't able to get to everyone's questions. Um, just trying to go back over here and see if there's any other ones that we can address really quickly. We're running out of time here. Um, had a question about why you would want to use port 2101. Um, when you're on the local network, and so let, let's say, for instance, you're interfacing with Crestron, and you're doing that through IP. Um, as I was saying before, all of the ASCII data from the serial port is passed through that unencrypted, non-secure port to the Crestron. So the Crestron system being on the local network, there's no outside access 
um, being allowed there. It's just you know two devices on the local network talking to each other. Um, you, you don't have to worry about any encryption there. It just allows that to be a little bit more seamless for you as far as that integration goes and a little less complicated. And the encryption is not really needed over the local network. Um, so that, that's the kind of situation where you would use that. Um, that's you know, why we, we have the encrypted port for things like the um, apps on the smartphones and things that are going to be coming in from outside and you want that encrypted. You don't want someone to be able to see that data going back and forth as you know, they may be able to interpret it and find out what a user code is or something like that. So that's why we encrypt that data. But the two devices on the local network can talk it and there, there's no need for that encryption and it just simplifies things quite a bit for the integration. And a lot of our third-party software integration um, can be done through the IP. So you'll, you'll see on our website, if you go to a partner page, we have like a list of partners. And there are a number of them that are marked as either main serial port or M1XCP. So again, it's just a matter of the connection method at that point. The data is the same. Very good questions. What, uh, what else do we have? Uh, I had a question. I'm, I'm just trying to digest these. I'm sorry for the delay there. But um, the question about sending ASCII code to third party devices, I think we've, we've pretty much covered that um, since that question was asked. So right. hopefully you got the information that you needed there. The person that asked that question, they were asking about pool control. Um, right. and, and again, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, for anyone wanting to see the M1's RS-232 protocol, that's available for download also. And the, the RP software has capability of sending custom ASCII strings, like for instance, to that pool control through through our M1XSP, our serial port expander. It would be limited control, but uh, as long as they publish their their RS-232 and, and what the string should look like, should be able to duplicate those in, in Elk RP. Okay. And we had a question here about control four. Um, let me just double check. I will only take a second here and see if that's one of the partners that can go through IP. Um, yes, the control four can be integrated through the IP. Um, so they they've developed based on our RS two thirty two protocol. They've developed a a driver or a plugin for the M one to allow the M one to be controlled through the control four devices. So that can be connected over the network. Um, so and you'll find that's the case with the majority of those third party software developers. So. Um, well, it looks like we have uh, used up our time here. We do appreciate everyone taking the time with us today. We hope this um, helped you out and maybe cleared up a few things for you about how the uh, M1 gets networked and integrated on the network. Um, if you do have other questions um, that maybe come up after the webinar, or um, like I so said, there were a few questions that we couldn't get to, we will try to provide a follow-up for those. But you can always contact tech support and let us uh, you know, help answer your questions over the phone or via email, and you know, we're more than happy to do that for you. Um, thank you again for spending your Friday afternoon with us, and we hope everyone has a, a great remainder of the day and a wonderful weekend. And thank you again, Brad, for, for help doing this presentation for us. Thank you. Thank you for your help and uh, for everyone attending. We greatly appreciate it.